Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Just Church. I'm Pastor John. Happy Mother's Day! Uh, Pastor Rachel will be bringing our message in a little bit. Pastor James is going to pray for us. Pa Pastor Kevin and Tammy, they're off this week. They're enjoying some time with the family. Um, they, he performed a wedding down in Maryland, and now he's got a whole bunch of folks that he's getting to spend some time with, so that's awesome. And we just praise God for him and his family. Um, I just want to thank you for being here today. I know it's been, it's Mother's Day, it's beautiful out, so, so we're so happy. I do have to apologize for people out in Facebook land. There is definitely some technical difficulties. We're hoping to put up a good copy of this soon afterwards. Um, but, um, and that's probably why I'm missing Kevin so bad today. <laughs> but anyway, let's, God's greater than all of that. So let's bow our hearts and our minds and come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for all that you do in our lives. We thank you for our moms. They, they, they take care of us. They nourish us. They pour into us beyond, and they love us unconditionally. They are just... They, they, they are there when when we don't want them to be there, and they're there when we don't even know they're there, and they're there when we need them the most. And so we just thank you, Lord, for them. We thank you for the, the fact that they just love us through everything, and they love us for who we are, and they want us to be the best that we can be. So, Father, we ask that you would help us do that. Help us to be the best uh, person that we can be, the best us, Lord, and we need your spirit. We need to be in your presence today. I'm just going to uh, invite you to come into this place and be amongst us and just live within us and excite us and just pour your Holy Spirit in us and out of us through your love. Lord, we want to love all those to, so that they may come to know you and the amazing work that you do and the purpose and plan you have for each one of us. We are so thankful, Lord, for you, and we just praise you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let us rise and worship the Lord our God.
which is a very simple song. And there's just worship songs that are just so simple, and they, you know, they don't have a lot of words, but they have a lot of power. And uh, this one's about the Holy Spirit, and you know, I often, you know, we can feel the Holy Spirit fill this room when we're at church, and you know, we can invite the Holy Spirit into our rooms, into our houses, into our lives, and it's just so powerful that we have that power to invite the Holy Spirit inside of us. You know, we have the power to live like Jesus and to love like Him and to walk like Him. And so I just encourage you to listen to the words of this next song and just really just um, just listen to the simplicity and just you know remember how great God is and just how powerful the Holy Spirit is. Stay
guys, it, that was so amazing. Just keep your eyes closed. Keep your, just stay real still if you can. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed here. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for living inside of us, Lord. Thank you for showing us the way that we are supposed to live. Even though we aren't able to always do it, we know that you are right there to help us through it. And Lord Jesus, thank you for coming down and dying on that cross and raising up again for us, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Amen. 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 Guys, welcome. Have a seat if you want. You can continue to stand if you want. That's cool, too. <laughs> A lot of times I stand during Pastor Rachel's messages. Is that to stay awake? No, no, not to stay awake. Okay, the heckling on Mother's Day has begun. I can't <laughs> By the way, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Excellent, excellent. Um, I am Pastor James. I'm here to talk to you guys about the connection cards. Pretty awesome stuff that we have. If you have never filled one out, Please grab a pen and fill one out. Let us know your information so we can sell it on the black market. <laughs> no, that's not what we do. Okay. So we're not going to, I mean, it, it's just us. It's like six people that actually look at it. We just want to know, and we would like to update our systems and, and let you know if there's any changes or something like that. That's why we want your information, not to sell it. Well, the other pastors don't. I do. <laughs> Make some money for the church, whatever. Um, also, on the back of the connection card, uh, if you would like to volunteer, you know, church isn't just coming on a Sunday, right? It isn't just experiencing what happens within the first hour or whatever. It's actually being involved. Once you become part of a church, that's when you really start to make your next steps, right? And, be, and we want you to be part of it. We want you to experience it, not for us. Okay, for you. Once you take ownership of something, it's so much better. And you get to experience God so much more. It sounds weird, but it's true. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I can't lie. I'm in church. <laughs> I guess I could, but I'm not going to. But um, also, if you want to join a group, this is the way to let us know that, that, that you want to. Okay? We have men's groups. We have women's groups. We have um, a lot of other groups that I should be starting very soon, since I'm in charge of that. But uh, I'll keep you guys posted. And if you can think of a group that you want to be part of, write it down for me. Write it down for me and let me know. Hey, listen, James, really, really, really want to learn about this. Cool. We want to help you. We want to teach you. Let's get a group organized and let's do it together. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. So that's pretty much what I have about the connection card. Let me pray for what I'm supposed to really pray for. The Holy Spirit, it just, it, it needed to be prayed for at that moment when I first came up. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this amazing congregation. Thank you so much for just allowing them to all, allowing us all to be here in your presence, Jesus. I pray for our, our, our hurting city, but I, I, I pray for... I just pray for your love to just flow on our city and all the cities around us. Lord, our country, our country is broken. It needs you, Jesus. It needs you, Jesus. Allow our people to not run from, from you, but run towards you. And that's where healing and love comes from. That's where peace comes from. Lord God, I pray for our world for the same reason. Lord, I thank you for all the mothers that are here today and all their sacrifices that they've made. And that's the same sacrificial love, Lord, that you give to us every day. It's a sacrificial love. And Lord, we love you and we're grateful and we're thankful that you love us back. It's in your holy name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to hear an awesome message from Pastor Rachel as she brings over the podium. I should really have one of my boys bring it over for you so you don't have to carry it every day. All right, let's give it up for Pastor Rachel. Am I okay? Am I in a good place? Hello? He's got his noise canceling. I'm good? 
What about me? Is this okay? How about Emily? Emily? Yeah. You guys look no, I'm just going to look at it right here. There, there we go. Okay, it looks good. All right. I just realized we're talking to <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is great to see you all here today. Um, happy Mother's Day to all the moms that are here and mom like people. There's a lot of people who fill that role. Um, and so I want to recognize that, that even if you're not a mom, even if you haven't given birth to a child, that does not mean that you are not mothering someone um, or, or something like your, your dog or your cat or whatever. There's dog moms, there's cat moms. I'm like, Nicole, right? Nicole right there. She's a, she's a, a, she's a great mom to her, to her baby. So just want to recognize that, that, uh, that this is a day to celebrate, not just, you know, those of us who have actually given birth to a child, but, but those who step up and those who care for others, those who nurture others, those who, who look after others. So keep that in mind. So I hope all of you mother-like people are going to have a wonderful, wonderful day today. Um, we are in week three today of a five-week series that we have been calling The Stand. And if you've been with us through the series, I hope you're enjoying it. I think it's been awesome so far. Really, really awesome. And if you haven't been with us, don't worry about it. I'm going to catch you up here. And you can also catch all of our past messages on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, on our web page. So feel free to go back because I'm going to talk about those messages as we walk through this one today as well. So if you did miss out, um, feel free to go back and watch those messages. So the first week we talked about how do we, as God's people, as Christ followers, stand out? And how do we do that at the right time, for the right reason, the right way, okay? And we read the story about Daniel and the other lost boys. If you don't know why I called them the lost boys, I'm going to tell you in a little bit. Um, but we, we talked about them standing out by choosing to eat differently, by choosing not to defile themselves with food that was devoted to pagan gods. But they did so respectfully, not self-righteously. And that same week, we talked about being all in. We talked about putting on the full armor of God at all times and all things. And Daniel demonstrated that for us through that story from chapter 1 in Daniel. And then last week, we talked about how we should stand up, standing up to others. And we talked about godly conflict resolution. We talked about when we're called to lovingly, gently, humbly help restore someone to be back in living a godly life. And so this week, week three, as I, as I said, it's a five-week series. We're going to talk about standing strong. And today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 6. And we're going to talk about a story that if you ever went to Sunday school or if you ever had any sort of Bible teaching as a child, you probably heard of, and that is Daniel in the lion's den, right? So the Daniel we have been talking about, all this stuff we've been talking about is the same Daniel, that is in the lion's den in your in your kid's story. And, and I love that we teach our kids these stories. So don't get me wrong. Don't take anything that I'm about to say wrong. But sometimes, sometimes learning these stories as a kid can do us a little bit of a disservice because we become challenged with these iconic Bible stories because sometimes it's difficult for us to then translate them into a more grown up, realistic understanding of what that story is really intended to show us because we kind of have these pictures in our head and it's kind of cartoony and it's you know cute and Daniel's super young and strong and handsome and you know he's he's going to, into the lion's den and there's these cute little lion clubs and they're jumping around you know they're they're kind of like you know flipping around together and snuggling and everything and that doesn't give us a really great understanding of the actual impact that this story should have in our lives as adults. And so we have to kind of translate that. We kind of have to unlearn a little bit of what we might have learned when we were kids. And so for starters, if you've been following along in our messages, as I said, we started in chapter one, and we had Daniel and these other lost boys, and we called them the lost boys because they were actually taken from their home in Israel, and they were taken to Babylonia to serve in the Babylonian government. And when they, that happened, they were about... 12 to 15 years old so they were young men okay and they were the best of the best they were handsome they were strong they were all all that they needed to be and so that that was when we first started there and then last week we talked through daniel chapter 2 and daniel chapter 4 and in both of those chapters daniel showed off the gift that god had given him to interpret dreams but we said at that time that daniel was about 40 to 50 years old so here we are in chapter 6 and guess what Daniel 
maybe still handsome. He may even be strong to a point, but he's definitely not young, okay? Daniel's thought to be around 80 at this point, somewhere in his 80s. So he's an older man. He's not a, this strong, strapping young man that, that you think of when you think of the, the Daniel and the lion's den story sometimes. And the lions most definitely do not look like little cubs or kittens <laughs> frolicking around, right? They are vicious, ferocious beasts. And the point is for them to rip someone apart, literally. So we gotta, we gotta start getting a little bit of this grown-up context in this iconic biblical story and see how Daniel's experience in the lion's den and how he got there is gonna help us understand how we, as God's people, are called to stand strong in the face of severe opposition. So here's a little bit more historical perspective. So at this point, Daniel's somewhere, as we said, around his 80s, and he's actually serving under a different king than we've been talking about before. If you've been with us, we've been talking a lot about King Nebuchadnezzar, right? And, and if you've been with us, you know, boo, he's a bad guy, right? Really bad guy. But there's a different king in place now in Babylon, and that's King Darius. And King Darius is actually a very different king than Nebuchadnezzar, because Darius is not known for being barbaric or brutal like Nebuchadnezzar was. But he is known for being very methodical very organized. So when he comes into power, one of the first things he does is he starts reorganizing what was in place. And if you remember, King Nebuchadnezzar had a whole bunch of magicians and spiritual advisors and sorcerers, and, and I don't really know if Darius kept them in place, but what he did do was he set up a system of 120 what they call satraps, okay? And a satrap was a sort of a protector. We're gonna learn a little bit more about that in just a second. And then if that wasn't enough, he felt that he needed administrators over those satraps. And so he, he appointed three administrators to oversee those 120 satraps. And one of those administrators was Daniel. And their job was to protect the kingdom against rebellion, not necessarily physically, but they were there to do things like administer taxes. They were there to guard over the financial affairs of the nation and make sure that everybody was following the rules that King Darius set. And so here we are in Daniel chapter six, and essentially the first few verses, first couple of verses, just recap what I've told you. And so it says, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. And so when we get to verse 3, here's where it starts getting pretty interesting. And if you've been with us, um, we've been talking about how smart Daniel is, how wise he is, how intelligent. And the first week we, we talked about a verse from chapter 5, verse 11, where it was said of Daniel, there is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. So not only is Daniel smart and wise, he's known to be holy and righteous and faithful to his God, our God, the one true God. And we talked a little bit about our first week, the fact that the Bible gives us zero dirt on Daniel, right? There's no secret love child. There's no murderous thoughts or actions or anything like we see with some other biblical characters. You know, big biblical icons, we see this. We get none of that with Daniel. We don't, don't hear anything about that. And that's going to come into play in this story today. And so in verse 3, this starts to get interesting here. And, and, and Daniel has done great at pretty much everything he's done. And so it says in verse 3, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. So remember, zero dirt, zero dirt. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his gods. So you see what's happening here? 
The satraps get a little bit sick of Daniel's excellence, right? And, and, and they, they want to start pulling him down because they're seeing him and he excels at everything despite really, really difficult circumstances, right? I mean, Daniel ripped from his homeland, taken to this different culture, this different place to be indoctrinated into Babylonian culture and government. And nevertheless, he excels. And he continues to advance through the ranks. But these other administrators, they get jealous. And so they decide they're going to take Daniel down. And it says, uh, starting in verse 6, So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in. So you see what's happening here. They're taking Daniel's strength, his faith in God, his righteousness, his trust, his faithfulness, and they're using it against him because they couldn't find any other basis to bring any other charges. And so this is where we can start taking some really good lessons from this story in chapter 6 about how to stand strong because we need to recognize that even when God is lifting you up, the world is going to tear you down, okay? Even if you're serving God, even if you're doing everything right, the world is going to try to tear you down. And we touched on something a little bit similar to this last week. We talked about godly confrontation, but then we talked about kind of the flip side of that, that drive-by confrontation, right? Those, those people who just are going to throw out everything at you, and, and you know, sometimes it's on social media, sometimes it's on Facebook, sometimes it's not. But, but where sometimes when, when we see other people succeeding, that's hard because we start to compare ourselves, right? And so we want to tear down. We want, we want to make sure that everybody knows, oh, there's a problem with this person. Oh, maybe they're not as great as they seem. And there's actually a phenomenon. There's a name for this. It's called the crab theory or the crab mentality or the crab syndrome. There's a book called the crab syndrome. And it refers to this phenomenon that if you have a bucket or a pot full of crabs and one starts trying to climb up to get out, the rest of the crabs will actually reach up and grab him and pull him down. I don't know if it's a him or her, but they'll grab the crab and they'll pull the crab down. And, and it, the book puts it this way. It describes it as, if I can't have it, neither can you. And that is true in the crab world. And unfortunately, it's true oftentimes in the human world as well. And we see that play out right here in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel stands out among the administrators and the satraps. And he proves himself to be exceptional. And the king plans to set him above the whole kingdom. And then as we said... The administrators and the satraps, the other ones, they tried to find something to use against Daniel. It says, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him. And so they start moving to what can we use against him? We can use his great faith in God. No dirt, but they're going to use his faithfulness, his steadfastness to God against him. That's pretty low. But this is another great lesson for us to learn right now, okay? Because sometimes I think we get a distorted view of who God should be to us as Christ followers, right? We think that we're his people, and, and, and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, and we're serving him, so we shouldn't face any difficulty. We shouldn't face any opposition. But that is such a misunderstanding of God's promises. Because not once in the Bible did he ever promise that our lives will be easy once we accepted Jesus, once we decided to follow him, right? If that promise was in there, I guarantee you there will be a lot of people, a lot of people sitting in these seats that are not here today. But that promise is not in there. There is zero biblical support for the theory that when you accept Christ, your life will get easier. 
But what he does promise is that when the difficulties come, not if, when, he will be right there with us. That we will never, ever, ever be alone. That he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. That he will walk right beside us through anything that we go through. That he will carry us if need be. That he will drag us through it if he has to. And he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And eventually, eventually and eternally, we will be able to be in his presence. Those are God's promises. But never did he promise that this life would be easy street, that it would be smooth sailing. But his promise that we'll never be alone, that's why we don't need to fear. That's why we don't need to worry. When we face hardships, we don't need to, to go into hysterics or, or panic. We need to know that God is with us. And we can take those hardships and we can use those hardships, right? For those of us who are in recovery, we're familiar with that term hardships. And we're familiar with the serenity prayer. And what does the serenity prayer teach us? It teaches us to accept hardships as the pathway to peace. We accept hardships as the pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you, that's God, will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. That's what we're talking about here. We're not going to have an easy life. We're going to have hardships. But those hardships bring us to something greater. And we don't have to worry. And we don't have to be disheartened. Pave your pathway to peace with that opposition. Count those trials as joy. And when others start coming against you, keep going and stand strong. As long as you're doing what you're doing for the glory of God. So to make a long story short, and you can read all about it, all in Daniel chapter 6, the satraps go on to the king, and they tell him how great he is. As we, as we read everything, they said, you're the greatest. Let's put this rule into place. You know, next 30 days, someone else prays, blah, blah, blah. And King Darius, being much like most kings, he, you know, he believed his own hype. He was like, yeah, you're right. I am pretty great. No one else should be praying to anybody else but me. So I think we're going to do that. So anybody who prays to any other gods or any other person, they're going to become the lion's lunch. And so that's the rule, and I have said it, and I'm King Darius, and that's the way it is. So and blah, blah, blah. So as planned, this is an issue for Daniel, clearly, because he's a great man of faith. He's a great man of prayer. And I just got to wonder for a second, how many of this, how many of us here in this room or how many of us out in Facebook land, would this decree be a problem for if our government all of a sudden went haywire and just said hey nobody else can pray to anybody else or any other god or anything like that blah 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 how many of us would this really really present a deep personal problem for and i'm not talking about getting on our soapboxes and oh your government can't do that no don't 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 take away my freedoms i'm talking about how many would be in anguish over this because our relationship with god our desire to come to him in prayer is that deep that heavy it's just a thought just something to think about back to daniel so here's daniel he's 80 years old he's facing the problem of having to stop this practice that he's been doing for his entire life or facing the lion's den facing these these remember they're not kittens these ferocious beasts lion lunch lion lunch that's right <laughs> But here's what Daniel says, says in, in, in verse 10. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room with windows opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So who, how, how did this change things for Daniel? Not one bit. He didn't pray more because of it. He didn't go to God and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe what's happening, God. Why is this happening? Help me, help me. And he didn't lose his faith and stop praying because of the decree. He did exactly what he had always been doing. And he brought it 
to his God. And I want to just give a little bit of a reminder here that, that you know, some of us know this story and we know how it's going to end, but Daniel did not, right? And that's, that's some perspective that we need to, to keep in mind here. Daniel did not know how this story would end. He was 80 years old. He had walked with God for a long time now. And, and you know how we talked about how faithful Daniel is? Well, guess what? That's nothing compared to the faithfulness of our God. And I'm convinced that the reason that Daniel was able to continue to do what he had always done was because God had proven himself faithful over and over and over in Daniel's life. He'd seen it. He'd seen the proof. He'd seen and know that God was good and that whatever he may face, God was going to be there with him. And so he heard about this decree and he just went about and he did what he always did. And this is another great lesson for us to learn here, that our first response to trials should never be to panic, but always to pray. And hopefully it's what we've always been doing like it is with Daniel. But regardless, we take it to God. You know, Daniel didn't stand up to the king and say, this is ridiculous. I can't believe you would make this, this rule. This is against God, and I denounce you, and this is terrible, and um, God's going to strike you dead. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of like the, the first week we talked about with the food, right? He didn't say, we're not eating your food. That's dedicated to the pagan gods. Forget it. This is, this is crap, you know? But he said very respectfully, hey, how about we try this? And his God was proven faithful. And in the same way, Daniel didn't create a stink. He didn't, he didn't make a big deal out of it. He just went about his business. And he brought it to God. Again, on his knees, humbly. Now, I don't know what sort of a stand you might be called to make, but I can guarantee you that at some point, if you walk with God long enough, you're going to have to take a stand. And what I can tell you from God's promises is he's going to be there with you. He's going to walk beside you. No matter how faithful or unfaithful you have been to him, he is faithful. And he will be there. But I'm also going to tell you that there's no guarantee it's going to work out the way you want it to work out. There's a lot of biblical figures who had just as much faith as Daniel. And for whatever reason, God didn't rescue them. John the Baptist, he was beheaded in prison. But he was faithful to the end. Stephen, he was the first martyr for his faith after Jesus' death and resurrection. And he was stoned to death at the hands of none other than a young Pharisee named Saul who eventually would become the Apostle Paul. And oh, by the way, most of the apostles killed for their faith. It, the promise, again, it isn't that it's going to work out the way we want it to. But the promise is that he's there and he's trustworthy. And I wasn't going to share this story because I know I've shared it before, but um, too bad. You're going to have to listen to it again. <laughs> uh, and the reason is because it came up on my timeline that six years ago today, um, our oldest daughter, Julia, uh, came home from uh, a lengthy mission trip that she had been on in Nepal. And I, I put up that picture. You can put that up, Joe, if you have it. If you don't have it, no big deal. Um, that's OK. No, no worries. So um, uh, my daughter took a gap, gap year uh, after high school and uh, went on, um, I was going to say World Race, but that's the other kid. So um, she went with uh, YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And um, she was in Nepal um, in uh, 2015. And most of you probably don't remember. Um, I do because my heart was there. Uh, a 7.9 magnitude earthquake hit Nepal uh, in 2015. And um, our daughter and her whole team were there. And it was devastating. I mean, we didn't know if they were alive. We didn't know if they were dead. We had no idea where they were. Um, it, the villages that they had been known to be in were completely destroyed. No survivors, no, no buildings. Um, it was heart-wrenching, and it was one of the worst things at that time in my life that I had ever been through. Um, thankfully, 
God was so good to us. And we got word pretty shortly after that that they were alive, that they had made it through. Um, but things were still pretty bad. I mean, there was no clean water supply. There were no, the roads had all been destroyed. They were actually in a remote village and they had to get back to Kathmandu, which is the main city, um, somehow to be able to fly home. And they didn't know how that was gonna happen. And, or if it was even gonna be safe or if there were, were or were not gonna be aftershocks. Um, and all of that stuff happened and it was, it was the hardest two weeks of our lives from the date of the earthquake until the date that we got word that they were coming home. And we didn't get to talk to her, we didn't get to see her, there was no contact. But what God did in my heart in those two weeks was that he helped me to understand that he loves her just as much as I did. And that he was with her every step of the way. And my greatest hope was that she would come home and she would come home safely. But I got to a place where God had loved on me and spoken into me so much that I knew that even if she didn't, he was still good. That he was still working all things together for my good in accordance with his will. So the promise is not that it's all gonna work out in the end the way that we want. And sometimes in our kids' version of Daniel and the lion's den, that's the message we get. We have to be real careful about that because that's really not the message. That's not who our God is. He loves us and he is working all things together for our good in accordance with his will, which we don't always understand. And we have to know that in all things at all times, he is still good and he is trustworthy at all times. So fast forward through this story, King Darius realizes that he was tricked into giving this order and that Daniel had broken it because of his faithfulness to his God. And the king is actually devastated because the king has a great affinity for Daniel. He really, really is fond of Daniel, just like most people were, unless you were jealous of him. And so the king gets mad because he knows he's been tricked, but he can't do anything about it because he's issued this order, and this order is irrevocable, okay? So there's nothing he can do about it. And so he's so devastated, it actually says that he goes back to his palace and he fasts and prays for Daniel. And Daniel is indeed put in the lion's den. Now, we don't get really any detail about what happens while he's down there. But we know that here's what happens. The king goes to the lion's den at the light, first light of dawn, and he yells in. They, they remove whatever it was that was over the, the cover. And he, they, he yells in and he says, and it says he said it in an anguished voice. And he refers to Daniel as the servant of the living God. And he asks, has your God rescued you? from the lions. And Daniel responds in verse 22, and he says, my God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. And it says in verse 23, the king was overjoyed, and he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. When you stand for what's right, you're always going to need to trust God with the results. And while those, those other guys, the satraps and the other administrators, it didn't work out so well for them. We read along in verse 24, and it says, At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all of their bones. Now, I know that could feel a little bit satisfying, but we don't want to rejoice over that because, because the real story here is Daniel's faith and his trust in God. But what comes next is almost as powerful as that story. And so in verse 25, it says, then King Darius wrote to all the nations and people of every language in all the earth. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree, another decree here, that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. 
His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will have no end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Oh my gosh, King Darius just became a believer, right? He just, he just converted. He's like, he is the living God. He saves. And, and he issues this degree, which probably isn't a great thing because he's like, everybody has to worship him. But, you know, but oh my gosh, look what Daniel did with his faith. And then the last verse there in chapter 6, verse 28 says, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the God is so, so very good when we place our trust in him and we resolve to stand strong even in the face of opposition. Let's bow our heads and pray together. God, we just come before you. We thank you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for these stories from the book of Daniel. And I pray that your word and your spirit would give strength to each one of us that we would be encouraged to follow you, to stand strong in the face of opposition when, when others come against us. And I pray, God, that we would be built in our faith, that when we come to you in hard times, that you would strengthen us, that you would help us to stand up to all the trials that come with living in this world. God, we thank you. We thank you for, for what you're speaking into us today through this message. Through, through our time here together. And I believe, God, that every time we come into your presence, every time that we encounter your Holy Spirit, like we just sang about, that you want to speak something into us, that you desire to give us revelation. And so, God, I pray for, for those who are open and hearing from you today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just be able to reveal new truths to us, would be able to just draw us deeper and deeper into relationship with you. And for those of us who are actively facing opposition, I pray that you would give us strength, strength to stand, to stand and continue to bring you glory and not worry, but trust that even Jesus was opposed and that those hardships, that opposition, that is a pathway to peace. It is the way for us to live with you. And that when we faithfully serve you, you will be right by our side. We can come directly to you. We can bring whatever it is that's troubling us directly to you in prayer every single day. We can always turn to you. And God, I pray for those who may be here today or who may be hearing this message and maybe recognizing for the very first time that they have a need for you. That this specific moment in time there's a recognition, a revelation that's coming that they need you. And I just pray that we would all turn to you, that we would all recognize that we need a Savior, that we need to surrender our lives to you, to trust you, to ask for your forgiveness, for ask, to ask for reconciliation. To just recognize that you are always there. You are always beside us. To give us the strength today by faith to say, I give my life to you. And I just pray for each and every person who's in that place, whether it's for the very first time today or whether it's, it's a case that you maybe just have, have strayed a little bit or just be off the path a little bit. We're going to pray as we pray every week. We're going to pray just a very simple prayer, a sinner's prayer. You can pray it in your head. You can pray it out loud. You can write it down and pray it later if you want. But we're just going to pray this together right now. God, I know I'm a sinner and I can't fix myself. But I believe that you can come into my life and make me new. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Oh, well, we had all these technical difficulties, so we didn't really talk about who was going to get do the offering. So, oh, you're, oh, me? Okay, it's me. All right, perfect. Great. Well, I'm sorry. You have to listen to me for a little bit longer, but um, this is a time in our worship service where we take the offering. And um, if you've been with us before, you know that... Um, 
you know, we take the offering very seriously here and, and not because we have to pay the bills and, and not because there is a, an actual, you know, material cost to doing ministry, um, but because we consider our offering an act of worship. And there's no accident that we do this during our worship service because just like prayer, just like worship through music, um, giving of ourselves, giving of our resources, giving of God's provision to us back to him is an act of worship. And it shows that we trust him. And I don't say this um, to try to get money out of any of you, believe me. And if you're visiting with us for the very first time, I just want to say, um, please, we have no expectation that you will give today. Um, we'd love to have your, your um, connection card. We'd love to have any prayer requests you have, but um, we don't want your money. Um, and God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. But very often, um, where we put our time and our resources, that's where our heart is. And so, if God's leading you, we just pray that you would just give as you're led. Um, there's many different ways you can give. You can give online if you'd like to. You can give um, right here, cash, check, whatever you'd like. Um, but just know that Whatever you give, we take that very seriously, and we steward it very, very, we try to steward it very well, um, and we take that very seriously, um, because this is your act of worship, and we don't want that to be wasted, ever. And so we also like to pray over that, so that we can have discernment, so that we can have wisdom as to how we use the resources that God has entrusted to us. So if you have your offering there, or if you don't have it, if you give online, you can use your telephone, or whatever you want to do, you can just... Raise that up to God, and we're just going to pray over it. God, we thank you. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for whatever it is that you've given us. Um, and I, I pray, God, for any of any of us who might be struggling, who might be in a place where financially we're just, we're just having so much trouble, God, I pray for your provision. And, and, and I'm not praying for prosperity gospel. I'm not praying for your abundance and, you know, plant a seed and it's going to multiply. I, I'm just asking God for, just like Jesus taught us, um, give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need today, God. And help us to discern of those resources that you entrust to us, what we should be giving back to you, what we can um, do to show you the devotion of our hearts. And I just pray that... Um, you would just speak into each one of us about that. And all of the resources that we are entrusted with here at Just Church, I pray that you would give us wisdom over. I pray for our leadership that we would we would um, steward those well, that we would spend them well, that we would um, use those resources to bring glory to you and to your kingdom. And we thank you, God. We praise you for being a God who is trustworthy, who is faithful at all times. We praise you, and we honor you, and we worship you, and we lift all of this up to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Um, as we prepare to close out our service, we're going to um, sing one last worship song. As we do, um, I think Dawn's going to be coming around with our, our bucket. If you do have something to put in the offering, you can um, feel free to put that in there. Um, and let's all just, just lift our hearts and our minds to God one more time um, as we come before him in worship. So two years ago today was the last time that we went down to Honduras for Trust Without Borders. Um, and that came back in my photos. And I remember getting back and just feeling feeling like useless here like what was the point of my life like I had I had done HVAC and I was like what is HVAC in like the whole grand scheme of the world and I just felt like so miserable going to work and just doing normal stuff um and then you know I God poured into me to to pour into the city to pour into a homeless ministry and um you know that became my my mission um it's just really hard because uh we lost jose this week in in one month there's two people gone and it's just really hard but like rachel said god is so good 
you know, he's so faithful. You know, this, I, you know, could make me not want to do homeless ministry, but it had the opposite effect. I want to do it even more. And I want, like, I see this hope that people need, and I just want to carry that to others. And, uh, you know, God is so good. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that with us. I love when Jerry cries. It just touches my heart so much. <laughs> Not like in a bad way. But it's just so special when we share those raw emotions with each other. Amen. You know, that's where God meets us. Like a flood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hear the word roaring with thunder with a new future to tell for the dry the season is over there is a cloud beginning to swell to the skies heavy with blessing lift your eyes offer your heart Jesus Christ open the heavens now we receive the Spirit of God we receive
anticipation we await the promise to come everything that you have spoken will come to pass let it be done upon us. We pray for your spirit to go with each one of us and to continue to speak into us throughout this week. Help us to see others as you see others. Help us not to be crabs pulling them down into the pot. Instead, God, help us to lift one another up. Help us to encourage one another. Let us learn from these stories, not just from the good, but from the bad, too. Help us to see Daniel's faithfulness and follow him in those footsteps and help us see the jealousy and, and, and the bitterness of the satraps and the administrators and help us to not allow that into our lives. We thank you and praise you, God, that you are a God who walks with us at all times and all things, that you're always there. No matter what, we can come to you. We can lift things up in prayer to you and know that you are faithful, that you are trustworthy. And so we come before you today just thankful for those reminders of these stories that are thousands of years old at this point, God. May we never stop learning from your word. We lift all of this up to you in praise and thanksgiving. In the name of God, who is our Father in heaven. In the name of God, the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for each and every one of us. And in the name of God and the person of the Holy Spirit who lives with and in us at all times. Amen and amen. It is always a privilege to worship with you all. Happy Mother's Day to all those moms and mom-like people out there. If you are not a mom or mom-like person, take good care of one. Love you all so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Like a flood, like a flood. Like a flood, we receive your love when you come. Like a flood, like a flood, we receive your love when you come. Like a flood, like a flood.